Welcome back, everybody. This is Jerry Bites. I'm Davis, an educator with over 10 years of experience. And I'm Orion, the founder of Stellar GRE. We're here to bring you your weekly bite-sized episode on GRE prep and grad school admissions. Check out our top-rated GRE self-study program at StellarGRE.com. Don't forget to use the code BITES for 10% off all memberships. So we often say in our intro, you know, GRE prep and grad school admissions, but we often focus heavily on the GRE. So I want to switch tack today and, and pick your brain on grad school, grad school admission, what it's like. One question that is often asked, a choice that students are faced with, uh, prospective students, is, you know, do you accept the stipend and not have to pay tuition or do you pay out of pocket? Uh, what's involved with accepting the stipend? Yeah, this episode will be specifically for folks who are getting PhDs or doctorates. It's pretty rare that this will come up in the pursuit of a master's degree. Um, basically, a lot of PhD programs on the surface are tuition free. A lot of PhD programs have a very small cohort, often fewer than 10 people at any one time. Uh, if you're accepted into this doctoral program, it's generally uh, expected that you will be offered a free ride in terms of tuition, as well as a small annual stipend to cover living expenses. Often the stipend is very, very low in terms of um, standard of living in certain housing markets. For example, I know that the stipend for doctoral students at Stanford University, one of the top programs in the world, was about $30,000, which would be very difficult to live off of in the Bay Area, which is one of the most expensive places in the world. Um, but a lot of students say, okay, that's 30,000 bucks in my pocket is better than going $150,000 into debt. And they might have a point. Like people should be very cautious about getting into that level of debt. They should have a plan associated with paying it off. Um, like they should do some market research to see, will this degree actually help me to secure a better paying job so that this is a rational investment in my future? Absolutely. That's right. And so, but the reason, uh, as I understand that, you know, universities offer uh, this type of PhD you know, program stipend is because you're expected to actually, you know, become a member of the faculty, essentially. You're teaching classes. You're, as you've mentioned before, helping your advisor in research projects. Um, so, you know, what are, because on face value, as you're saying it, $30,000 in the pocket and teaching some classes seems like a much better deal than uh, kind of being a, a free agent PhD student where you're paying out of pocket, but you're not, you know, beholden to the university staff as part of the staff. So, so really, what are the drawbacks of accepting the stipend? Yeah, you, you touched on them, which is that, uh, yeah, there is no free lunch. So grad students who accept the tuition and the stipend are expected to generate value for the university. So in addition to all of your studies as a full-time student, you will also be expected to teach classes as an adjunct. Um, teaching classes requires you to create syllabi, which is incredibly time-consuming, to actually teach the classes, to have office hours, to grade papers. You will also likely be expected to be a research assistant to your uh, dissertation chair. Um, that could take years. You will be expected to draft and edit um, academic papers based on that research. You will be expected to serve on committees and potentially be involved in showing prospective students around the university or interviewing them or being made, uh, making yourself available for interviews. The point is, is that there's a lot of labor that is connected to the tu free tuition. And this is never really explicitly spelled out in the students' contracts. It's not like there is a 1,000 hour per year maximum after which these students can clock out. On some level, it's very amorphous, it's very ambiguous, and the university, which has way more power than these individual students, can sometimes lean on that in a borderline exploitative way. Uh, so personally, 
the way that I the way that I went to grad school is I paid out of pocket. Paying out of pocket is, is I I liked it because I could clock out. Like once I was done with my studies, I could walk away from the university. Now, in order to pay out of pocket without going into substantial debt, I had to work full time on the side. But here's the thing. If you're taking the free ride, you're going to be working full time on the side anyway. You're just going to be working as a research assistant, as a teacher, as an advisor. I could work full time on the free market and make 10 times as much money as I would be making if I were a faculty assistant, for instance. So if I'm gonna be working full-time anyway, I'd rather make more money and then pay the tuition out of pocket that way. Does that make sense? No, that makes a lot of sense. And it also uh, reminds me of the point you made earlier in this episode, which is you know really do the research to understand what kind of degree you're getting into, why you're going to grad school in the first place. For example, if you know academia is your target uh, target, you know, job that you're looking for, then taking the stipend and getting that experience and working as an adjunct for that period of time, the university life is what you're there for. And if your degree is going to facilitate you getting a, you know, professorship type position, then that seems a much different, uh, much smarter choice. It's a different choice to consider. It's a different, you know, balance to weigh as opposed to getting a degree that's going to put you back out in the job market. That's certainly true. Uh, if your goal is to work in academia, it makes sense to take the free ride and get that job experience on campus. Here's the thing about that. I've worked with a lot of students over the years who want to get a position in academia to become a full professor on the tenure track. And um, there's a few, there's two really important things to consider here. First of all is there are just 50 times more new doctorates that are minted every year in this country alone than are new openings for tenure tech positions at universities. So the competition among other really smart people who have doctorates from top universities is absolutely fierce. And because of that, you don't have a lot of optionality in that market. You might have to take a job wherever you are offered it um, anywhere in the country. Um, the second thing to understand is that you should have some experience teaching first. A lot of people have a romanticized vision of what being a professor looks like. You have this office full of books in this cozy little corner in an ivy-covered, you know, red brick building, and students come in all the time, and you get to discuss ideas, and um, you know, you're, you're paid to think, and it's like that's not the reality of being a professor at a university. It's far more tedious. Uh, the politics are insufferable. And most students don't really care. They're there to take your class so that they can get the credit to move on to the next thing. So you should know that you actually like teaching. Try it out. We date before we get married. So if you can, find a way to teach before you decide to put all of your eggs in this basket for five to 10 years to become a teacher only to realize that it's not what you expected it to be. I will uh, just reinforce and concur with what you're saying there. And it's interesting to note as well that especially for the humanities, any kind of degree in the humanities, uh, it's doubly true what Orion has just been saying uh, in terms of the saturation compared to the availability of open positions. Uh, in the marketplace. That was something that I faced after my graduate degree in the Bay Area, which is why I switched into the private sector and consulting. Um, and, but, uh, you know, there is more chance for anyone who is wanting to go this path not to be completely discouraged if it's in the hard, you know, hard sciences, hard math that I have learned at least in the past six, seven years has a much higher likelihood of getting a, a position. It could be changing, but the point is research, know your trends, know yourself. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back next week for another bite-sized episode of GRE Bytes. If you have a topic you'd like to discuss, please let us know at stellargre at gmail.com. And if you're ready to take your prep to the next level, check out our top-rated GRE self-study program at stellargre.com. Use the code BITES for 10% off any uh, product. Talk to you soon.